Episode of Progress, Potential, and Possibilities, discussions with fascinating people designing a better tomorrow for all of us. I'm your host, Ira Pastor. Well, welcome, everybody, again to another episode of our show, bringing another really fascinating guest today involved in creating better tomorrow and some really unique fronts. Uh, today, we have the honor of being joined by Colonel Alex Khan, who serves as both Chief Instructor uh, at the Ghana Military Academy, as well as Operations and Training Staff Officer at the Headquarters Central Command of the Ghanaian Army, as well as a Research Fellow uh, at the Africa Research Institute Doctoral School on Security and Safety Science at Abuja University. Uh, Colonel Khan has over uh, two decades of military experience with extensive backgrounds in areas like leadership and security policy, operations management, humanitarian operations, uh, program management and monitoring and evaluation, training and conflict for crisis and security management. Uh, his extensive background and leadership experience really positions him uh, on national and international uh, United Nations missions and has really equipped him with a variety of extremely critical problem solving skills. Uh, Colonel Khan is also a professional security management specialist, a uh, certified protection professional. Uh, he's a senior consultant for the United Nations Institute for Training and Research Multilateral Diplomacy Program, a member and subject matter expert for the International Association of Professionals and Humanitarian Assistance and Protection Program, and a member of ACES International and their 40,000 strong membership of professional security team. Uh, Colonel Khan previously has served in a wide variety of assignments, including as chief of military training and evaluation officer for UN peacekeeping missions led in Mali. Uh, he led operational logistics and administrative efficiency of Ghanaian trip uh, UN peacekeepers in South Sudan. Uh, also led an international team to monitor uh, certain ceasefires, uh, violations in the area of the Democratic Republic of Congo. So it's been all over the place. Uh, Colonel Khan studied at the, uh, the Ghana Institute of Management and Public Administration uh, with a focus on defense and conflict studies and public admin uh, at the Ghana Military Academy with a focus on military operation, art and science studies. He has his MBA in finance from University of Leicester and currently completing a PhD uh, in conflict analysis and resolution. We have a lot to, to discuss with him. We're honored to have him with us today. Uh, but Colonel Alex Khan, thank you so much for taking the time out of your schedule to come talk to us for a little while. Thank you. I'm I'm grateful, and it's a privilege. It, it's great having you, Alex. You know, I, I would love to just you know start off as we typically do uh, by giving you the mic for a little bit, just to talk about your background, a little bit about your your background story, uh, how you found yourself uh, in public service and military service, uh, and a little bit of the early days. If that's a great way to start out. Good. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, like I said earlier on, uh, it's a privilege to to speak to you. Yeah. Um, I come from a family of. 12 children from three women and from my mother's side, uh, I'm the last of the three. And interestingly, among the 12 children, I'm the only person who has gone beyond college. Okay. Um, so um, right from my junior high school, among my colleagues, I was more or less among the best. <laughs> so <laughs> that that encouraged me to want to do so much and then go beyond what the everyday person will sometimes give up or think that okay, it is it is too much, so I'll not do that. So I was privileged immediately after high school, I moved to 
live with an uncle who was a lieutenant colonel in the in the Ghanaian Armed Forces. So that's where the the, the interest crept up, and uh, he said, "Okay, I think from the way I see you, you'll be interested to fit in my shoes." <laughs> so with his guidance and everything, I joined the military. I commissioned as a second lieutenant, as an infantry officer. Interestingly, right from that time, this interest in learning or climbing the academic ladder was there. So I was more aggressive about improving myself because then my colleagues who were privileged had joined the university and uh, I felt like I was more or less laid back. Of course, I'm a very proud, I was a very proud uh, military officer. But I said, no, the military should not just keep me where I am. So I have to keep pace with my colleagues who were privileged to have joined uh, universities and everything. So I became serious both in my job as a military officer and then that's academic parts. So along the line, every opportunity that I could get to more or less advance in education, I took it. I was privileged. I did some program in the U.S. And because the U.S. system of education is marketable, okay. it helped me to continue to do everything I had to do. And then... Finally, I had to enroll in a PhD in the Nova South East University. But like I said, I've been privileged. My career has been successful because everything that I was entitled to or I had to do, if you want to compare me to my colleagues, yes, I've not been the best, but I've tried to be with the best. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. I've been privileged. Uh, in the Ghanaian Armed Forces, we are privileged. We do peacekeeping. So I've been privileged to work in the Sierra Mali, uh, DRC, South Sudan, in, in various capacities. And that exposure more or less builds my confidence that, okay, you have left Ghana, you come here, this is what others are doing. So you could do it or even do better. So that's, that gave me the confidence that, okay, I could even do a PhD because I've been teaching all this time. Then there is something, there's an evidence that, okay, the guy has really been trained to teach, not only in the military, but in other institutions. So that encouraged me to want to do the PhD. And I must say, academically and professionally, I'm doing well. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Outstanding. Outstanding. And, and you, know, you know, when I've read some of your um, materials, Alex, and, and I've, you know, I've listened to you on some previous shows and talks you've given, you know, you always point out that Despite all these things that you are, you know, an MBA, doing your PhD, um, a, a teacher, a, a personal, a private security person, a member of the military, at, at your core, you're a soldier. Uh, and you point out that whether it's Marines or Coast Guard or Navy SEAL or whatever it is, you're a soldier first and foremost. Yet you've been put in, as I mentioned in the bio, and you were just talking, um, peacekeeping missions uh, all over the place. Um Talk a bit, a little bit about some of the early challenges that you found in making a soldier a peacekeeper, because they're very different things. I mean, obviously, we think of soldiers as like, fighting the battles, but you in the peacekeeping field have to do a lot more. I mean, you have to deal with uh, migration and displacement and potential sexual violence that's occurring, um, humanitarian operations. Talk a little bit about sort of what it takes to make a soldier a peacekeeper, and some of the challenges there that you've witnessed. Okay. Interestingly, I'll start with the, what's the late uh, UN Secretary General. Interestingly, who was a Ghanaian, the Kofi Annan. Yep. yep. He said that peacekeeping is not 
the work for soldiers. But only soldiers can do it. <laughs> Peacekeeping is not a work for soldiers, but only soldiers can do it. So, of course, like you know, I am an infantry officer. Soldiers are not trained to keep peace. But because of how the world has become, the soldier has to be trained or conscientized or prepared to leave that soldiering terrain now to become a peacekeeper. The good thing about UN is that before you are deployed in any such environment, you are trained. And the train is so, death is so rigorous, it's, they will try to put you in the peacekeeping environment. Because a team normally who are supposed to be part of this uh, contingent, they will go to the mission environment, live with them at least one week. So by the time they come back, they have the true picture of where you are going. So this UN model, you go through, as we speak, they do it about eight weeks. In the past, it was five weeks. You go through all that. Almost every situation you have to go and meet in the peacekeeping environment, they will take you through it. You do both classroom and practical things. And the, the trainers are people with long years of experience. So by the time you leave your country and you are inserted in the peacekeeping environment, you would have mentally, psychologically, physically, you would have been inserted even before you go. That is one. So we are trained before we move to the peacekeeping environment. Now, the average Ghanaian, we have very interesting cultures. We are so open. We are so sociable. We learn so quickly. We adapt so quickly. Good. That has helped the Ghanaian peacekeeper. So most areas we have been, of course, we are not angels, but we always adapt quickly and we are able to understand the cultures, the story, the history of the conflict. And we are able to do what we have to do as far as the UN mandate is concerned. And because we've done it over so many years, we have that body of knowledge always more or less coming back because the people who are teaching you are people who have been in the environment, they know how things work, and then they will share those experiences. So it's more or less practical. So there's a lot of things that training that we do that always help the Ghanaian soldier anytime we are in the peacekeeping environment. Yeah. So you the were... secret, yes, Wait. the secret, one, the secret is training. The training that they give us, the culture of the Ghanaian, we are so habitable, we are open. And yes, because like I said, we are known to be very good in the peacekeeping. So you will not go and do things that will tarnish the image of one, your contingent, and then, and then Ghana. Mm -hmm. So that is what has helped our transition. And it has worked all these years very well. And, and on top of that, you know, one of the things that I've heard you talk about, aside from the training, uh, is a specific philosophy of yours, uh, a philosophy of deploying wisdom, uh, whether that's in South Sudan, the Congo, any of these unique environments that you go into. Uh, you're trained as a peacekeeper, but you have to really understand much more. Um, talk about your philosophy of deploying wisdom as a peacekeeper. Good. I, I have invested so much time in trying to tap into the likes of uh, uh, Epictetus, uh, all those philosophers. <laughs> and I've seen that there's one thing that catches up. The focus is 
as a person trying to build your stock of wisdom. Now, when you have that, of course, everyday things that come to us, 99% of the time, they are things that are coming up. It's like things that have happened in the past and it's being replayed. So if you have, and of course, how do you become wise? It is one either reading or listening or, I mean, all those things. So things come to you and it's like, okay, it appears I've read this in some way. I've heard this in some way. So how did the person handle it? And what's, how do I bring it to today to fit in the current situation for me to be, to be able to handle it? And when you read about all these guys, they, some of them had, they went through serious hardship and they survived because they didn't use that everyday common sense, something more or less deeper than they are, something that was higher of themselves. They tapped into it and then it helped them to be able to address all those issues. So I've always gone back to either, okay, who is known to be more wiser than I am? How did a person fail or succeed? And which of their stories can I bring to today to use to address my problem? And since I discovered that it has worked very well, look, no matter the situation you are handling, if you resort to wisdom than emotions, you may not be perfect, but you will get it. Yeah. Excellent. So that that has helped. That has helped. Absolutely. Taking that concept now, um, so you talk about training, you talk about uh, the philosophy of deploying wisdom, um, and, but your experience, you know, as I mentioned in the bio, has extended beyond uh, conflict zones. And you are also, <clears throat> as I mentioned, very active in the, in the private security domain. You wrote this very interesting article recently. It was uh, entitled How Security Guards Create Insecurity. And you are basically talking again about these same philosophies, but in the security environment and in the private sector that, look, you know, it's not just about putting a guard there uh, without wisdom, uh, whether it's a bank in this particular case, you know, you're talking about the, the Central Bank of Ghana and, and terrorist uh, issues and organized crime and all sorts of things like that. But you really have to understand the full system, the, the people, the property, the reputation of the organization and so forth. Talk a little bit about uh, this article, if you would, and, and a little of your experience uh, in, in taking these learnings to the private sector as well. Good. Um, when you read about corporate security, it always taps into some concept of military. Right. So I said that, okay, one, I have been trained as a military officer. The private security space is a different space altogether, different body of knowledge. So how do I bring the two together? Now, almost most of the concept in the private security space are borrowed from the military. Right. So I said, okay, if I have that opportunity or uh, advantage, then why not? Let me look at what happens in corporate security or private security and how it's fitted. Now, the motivation for that article, in most areas that I have been to, you see this private security guards. Normally, a client will come to the company and then they are they are more or less seconded in quotes to, to these companies. Now, my concern has been, what training have we given to this private security guard? Like you said, he's supposed to go and protect either people, properties, information, or the reputation of the company. How have we broken down? How have we dissolved it? How have we translated it to this poor private security guy to understand it? 
And the research I have done, instead of these guys going to put it, they actually go and now they become a liability because they have not understood exactly what they are there to do. Sometimes they think that, okay, I am there in body, so I'm being protection. But it goes beyond just being there in body. Do you know the threat that is likely to come? Do you know when it will come? Do you know how it will come? If you know all that, how have you been prepared psychologically in terms of equipment, sometimes even your own protection? Uh, so that was what motivated me <laughs> to, to write that article. I said, no, instead of these guys going to protect, they actually become liability to the people they are protecting. <laughs> <laughs> So that was the motivation for, for that article. Excellent. And I think over a period, I have been proven right that really, that is how it is for most private security companies. Excellent. Talk a little bit about, because I've also seen you, um, and there's some you know very interesting um, mentoring motivational speaking that you've been doing um in terms of corporate leadership management um again tying to corporate security but you also and i neglected to mention this in the bio another one of your many roles you're also involved in this uh, enterprise capacity systems that does lecturing uh in terms of coaching uh, risk management and so forth um i also give a presentation you were talking about peter uh you know the management specialist peter drucker um talk a little bit about what what you're doing uh, on that front as well because it's it's sort of tangential to uh, your security yeah. apparatus but once again it's sort of talking about sort of all the skills that you've developed on this front. Say a few words Good. of what you're doing on, on the management Good. consulting front, if you would. Um, interesting. At some point, I discovered these people like Les Brown, uh, this leadership guy, uh, John Maxwell, yep. uh, Jim Ron, all those top guys. And when I listened to them, I said, okay, so can I be like these guys? <laughs> oh, <laughs> what, can, what can I do to become like them? So I started, like you said, reading, listening, public speaking. And of course, as part of our training as military officers, we are taught public speaking. Yep. But I saw that the way we are taught to do it in the military environment is different from what is done in the corporate world. So I said, okay, fine. I have, I've been privileged. I've done an MBA in finance. Right. How do I use my military background with what I have listened to these guys do? Translate that to do something that will benefit the Ghanaian environment or the Ghanaian market. Yep. So luckily, I had a few people who know a few people in certain areas. So once in a while, I'll get this... Uh, invitation, okay, come and speak to us on this and that and that. And just like you said, there is so much that all of us can do. In fact, when I take myself as a person, look at where I'm coming from, my background, I've seen that it is because of continuous learning yeah. and my ability to bring to practice some of the things I have learned. That has brought me where I am. So I said, okay, then why won't I develop interest in this area? And then share that idea, whether I'm being paid for or not. It will change somebody. It will let somebody improve on their area of work. So that was why I developed that interest <laughs> in that area. And most areas I have gone, so, ah, you, you are a military officer. You are doing security. So this part of you, where did they come from? And I was motivated to hear that because it's not something all of us do. And it's like something you see, you wish you could be good at, you, you take steps to do it. And then people are telling you it is good. Uh -huh. right. So it also motivates me. Uh -huh. that, is, that is that other part of me. 
No, I, I think it's, uh, you know, I say it, it completes a, a nice picture of everything that you're involved in. And, you know, we've seen so much about, uh, especially, for instance, here in the United States with uh, what was known as Operation Warp Speed, about the importance of connecting sort of military thinking uh, in deploying, say, the, the COVID vaccine. And I just thought it was a, another interesting piece of sort of where you've been and some of these different roles that you've you've been going through. Um Alec, if, if you can talk about uh, a little bit about, because I know you do, you research a lot of different topics. And we talked about peacekeeping and humanitarian operation, but I know you're at, you're you know interested in terrorism and extremism and counterinsurgency and all sorts of other qu quite interesting topics. Um, can, can you talk a couple of minutes about what your PhD is is focused on right now? I mean, I know it broadly is in conflict resolution, but uh, can you give us any insights some some uh, some tips there on on what you're going to be ultimately uh, presenting, and I think in 2024, you're finishing up, but uh, anything you can say there that's not confidential, that'd be awesome. Yeah, it's been a very interesting journey to me. And of course, uh, I, I was privileged because I did my um, associate degree through online, I did my MBA through online, and then the PhD I'm also doing is online. Now, and what I've realized is that the US PhD is so rigorous. You, you will be pushed. You will be pushed with a lot of things that you have to read. That is one. And of course, the way we are trained in the military, that aspect has never been a challenge, but the fact that I have to combine it with work, that has been. There, there are several areas I could choose but I chose international security. So that is where the extremism and the terrorism yep. come in. And then security that involves relationship with people because especially now, uh, like you said, uh, trans, trans border, transnational crimes, terrorism, money laundering, all those things are now internationalized. Yep. So I'm going to look at terrorism with focus on West Africa. Okay. Yeah. And then one area that I'm also interested in is uh, national security. Mm -hmm. Because especially in Ghana, it's an area that most people hear national security is like, oh, national security is something that is hanging in the air. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But it's actually what me and you will do or not do if you put all together, that becomes national security. But it's, it's beyond having good military, good police, good coast guard, good navy, good air force. It is far beyond that. Right. You look at the economic part, the, the political part, the socioeconomic part, the relationship with other countries part. So it's so broad. And yeah. I think it's an area if I know it well, I can help in so many ways to get the national security of Ghana and so many other countries to work well. So that is going to be my focus of my, my project. I've started it bit by bit, but I'm enjoying it. Yeah, no, it's... Uh... I mean, it, it's clearly, as I said, you know, you, the, the next step in this uh, amazing evolution that, you, that you've been on. Uh, it's been interesting because, you know, one of the things that we did highlight uh, on a show a little while ago was the, the the illegal wildlife trade in certain parts of Africa and connecting to terrorist finance. But, yeah, it's going to be interesting to uh, ultimately read <laughs> what you come up with uh, uh, as your dissertation and, and, and all that. I mean, it, really a fascinating uh uh, array of topics there. Um, what anything else happening for 2023? You know, putting your PhD aside for now. Um, any other conferences you're going to be presenting at? Other initiatives, public facing stuff that we should know about uh, per Colonel Alex Khan and, and your many activities. Yeah, there's there's a long list of things. Um, okay. There's a project a project that is a. Uh, it's ongoing now. The EU is helping Ghana to develop again uh, its capacity against this extremism and terrorism. So 
I know you monitored, I was in Spain some few weeks ago to yeah. learn about the Spanish policing system and how we can, we can, uh, some of the, the lessons learned that we can bring it to, to Ghana. So that project is ongoing. Once a while, I go out as a facilitator. And then next week, we are doing a tabletop exercise on more or less responding to this kind of, some of these incidents in some of our cities. So it will take the form of tabletop and then we'll do the actual exercise. Um, regarding conferences, there's one in South Africa. I'll be talking about something around uh, this terrorism thing, mm -hmm. but then specifically on finance, financing terrorism. And my focus will be in, in Africa. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There's one conference I will also attend. That is it's an online one with the university in the Canada along the same issue about the terrorism. And then when you come back to the military, there's, there's a lot, of course, because of what I do this, my table is almost, <laughs> it's almost full, almost every time, but by God's grace and with the training the military has given us, yep. we are able to do most of these things and do it well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. One other thing I just wanted to ask uh, about us why I have you, um, you know, another uh, thing that's very important to you um, is coaching and uh, mentoring the next generation. And clearly, you know, um, if we, you know, if the, if the Ghanaian uh, military academy produces a thousand Colonel Alex Khans one day, um, you know, there's not going to be any problems left <laughs> for us to solve in the world. But that being said, talk about a little uh, bit of what you're involved in, in terms of uh, the next generation, the youth that uh, is coming along, whether it's uh, encouraging them in, uh, in public service, in STEM, whatever it may be. Uh, just say a few words about uh, uh, your involvement involvement with uh, coaching and mentoring okay. so because of my background uh, whilst growing up i i more or less didn't get somebody i could always call and say hey this is what is bothering me this is what i don't understand this is where i want to go how do i go there what are the hurdles and so out of that and my interaction with most graduate i realized that there's there's actually a book i have i've i've done and it's been edited now <laughs> so mm -hmm. hopefully if things go well I'll, it will be published it's it's on how to transition from school to the workplace Got it. and it's it's because of my interest in this coaching and mentoring thing. I realized that um, all of us, at some point, beyond our parents, because most of the time, it's our parents that when we are, we don't understand certain things we go to, mm -hmm. or some relative or some uncles. But with my interaction with most of these guys, I saw that there's a lot they don't know. Because they go to school, they spend four years doing undergraduate uh, work. And then they focus so much on how to learn and pass their courses. Though they know that they are working, they are in school to go to the work environment. Most of them don't have that knowledge. Okay, so how is life like out of school? So I developed that interest in of I'm going to research and really know. Interestingly, I didn't go to brick and mortar uh, brick and mortar uh, university. So I have to now, out of my interaction with them, know what happens there. Then, based on that, try to advise them what they can do. Mm -hmm. Sometimes, using my own experiences or people I have coached and they are fine or they are doing well. 
use them that, hey, I met this guy, I met this girl, he or she was here, and from my advice and interaction, now they are here. So if you can take my advice, there's a high possibility that whatever you want to achieve, you may get there. And like I said, with my readings around people like John Maxwell, Jim Rohn, Les Brown, I had a lot of stories to tell them about the fact that, yes, their beginning may be not be the, the way they, they wanted or they wished for. <laughs> but if they do certain things, if they don't do certain things, there's no limits. Yep. And I'm happy to see them later that they are doing well. So that's motivated me to spend time there to even develop my own self to be able to do it well. Outstanding. Really, really outstanding work, Alex. I mean, it's just uh, an amazing, the uh, impressive journey you've been on uh, with everything you're, you've been involved in, what have you continued to do, especially uh, with your PhD and, and, and the continued, uh, not just the research, but uh, obviously training this next generation. Um, as you say, you know, ultimately deploying wisdom to the world uh, via these different methods. So it really, really uh, amazing. Jay will continue to follow and 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 stay in touch with you um, and wishing you the best with it. Um, the uh, again, for everybody that uh, is going to be listening to this particular episode of our show across the various podcast networks or watching on the YouTube channel, again, you've been listening to Colonel Alex Khan, uh, Chief Instructor, Ghana Military Academy, Operations and Training Staff Officer, Ghanaian Army Headquarters Central Command, Research Fellow, the Africa Research Institute, as well as member of ACES International, a variety of other things, uh, mentor, scholar, soldier, peacekeeper, extraordinaire. Um, Alex, I, I want to thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come talk to us for a little while, to educate us on what you're up to. Obviously, thank you for everything you're doing uh, in your area of the world there. And as we like to say here on our show, um, thanks for helping to create a better tomorrow for people via what you do. Really, really great story. And you know, it was a really honor having you. Thank you very much. And I wish you the best in what you do. And it's it's always a privilege to, to speak to people like you. It's a privilege to speak to people like you. So thank you. Thanks for being there.